Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, and hello to, um, to everybody, of course, colleagues and all. Um, my name is Kleena Raleigh. Of course, as mentioned, I'll be talking about some of the conflict threats and violence rates across Africa. And I'm going to take a little bit of a different um, perspective this time as I did last year, um, in that I'm not going to tell you too much about the, let's say, the, the bulk of the conflict occurring. In fact, conflict across Africa is remarkably consistent in that it tends to have between um, it tends to have between 500 and 600 events per week. Um, it is often located, of course, in, in key hotspots. Um, and it's been that way for, for as long as I've created ACLED. So it's been about 20 years that it started in Africa. And African conflict, again, has been remarkably consistent during that time. What I am going to talk about is what we can glean from the patterns of these individual data points uh, that might be useful. Next slide, please. I believe that. Oh, I can't move. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so some of the conflict patterns. Oh, please. Thank you. Uh, some of the conflict patterns that I have noticed um, across both case work and, um, and collecting these data uh, for 20 years across Africa is, of course, that conflict is widespread, varied, and often beneficial to political interests. So in that time, um, and the many hundreds of thousands of events that we have collected for African countries, what we have found, of course, is that the patterns themselves do not correspond to things like um, climate or poverty or even poor governance. They respond very closely to political competition, which is my second conclusion here, which is that political competition causes conflict and conflict arises from a contest for power. Um, the third point is that global powers have interests but not preferred local outcomes. And so when we see a number of, for example, Gulf states becoming involved within different um, African conflicts, it is not because they have a particular uh, group that they want to win, but they have local outcomes that they would prefer to actually see because of their own interests. And of course, the group themselves is um, the group themselves that they may be supporting is um, helpful, but not determinative of those interests. Uh, groups and elites respond to what I call a violence market. So uh, over the last few years, a lot of people have been talking about the notion of a political marketplace and a violence market. And I'll break down what I mean by that in the next slide. Um, but I really do want to emphasize that what we have seen across all countries is that conflict is not a breakdown in governance. It's not about state failure. It's not about fragile states. It is a feature often of modern governance and political change. And so understanding that, it makes it a little bit easier to anticipate where we expect to see violence and how we expect it to manifest. Next slide, please. So here is an idea that we've been working on for quite a while. It's the notion of the violence market, the war business, and conflict investments and assets. And the way I wanted to break this down is by understanding that we often talk about violence in terms of who is involved in the recruitment of those people within it. But in fact, the, the actual labor costs or the violence per unit is one of the easiest things to, to understand within this, this, um, this new kind of, let's say, marketplace, which is that labor costs are relatively low and individuals can move from one group to another. And that's especially true now that the most common form of conflict across African states and indeed across the world is coming from militias, not from insurgent groups, and in part, sometimes associated with, with state security units. But these militias have proliferated and the conflict that comes from these, um, these types of organizations or these types of groups is informal employment and it, and it could be considered very similar to a labor market. So, of course, what that means is that when we think about initiatives to deal with conflict and we focus on the violence market, people tend to think about DDR initiatives and other things like that and the price or the cost of violence. But really what we need to be thinking of is further up the chain, both the economic opportunities in the context of conflict and, of course, the financial opportunities and incentives that allow people to organize um, 
young young people in this market towards conflict. And so we can think about the main resources for that being a financing through commodities or contraband. Um, and of course, there's often there's often effectively an organizer, which is what we mean by the war business. And that organizer is not ideologically inclined, but rather the incentive is to keep conflict active until the costs, of course, until the costs are continue to be lower than the um, than the profits from it. And that's why you can see that in many cases, the militias that we're seeing proliferating across African states have, in some cases, organized into organized crime. So organized crime and political violence or political violence becoming a form of organized crime um, is increasingly is increasingly seen across across the different countries. And so I'll move on now to really what I think is is pushing all this. As I mentioned earlier, we focus quite a bit on political competition as fueling this market. And indeed, elites invest in conflict, uh, particularly political elites who are looking for authority, control of either populations or, or physical space, um, but appointments, appointments, assets, businesses, infrastructure, these are really what people are contesting over. Um, and trying to and trying to build up effectively enough investments through violence and of course through political maneuvering in order to secure their authority structures. Um, this is leading to large scale corruption. Of course, they might be spoilers and peace negotiations. But what we also find is there's an incredibly fluid alliance structure um, because of course the the violence is is um, self reproducing because many people will invest in it. Um, and here, of course, we see quite a number of senior elites and changes in state structures, especially appointment structures, and by, by virtue of that elections, creating a lot of new opportunities to create a conflict investment, to hire somebody to organize for the violence, and then for that labor market to restart and, um, and, different, and different organized crime and political violence to be moved around. So... By seeing it this way, rather than, for example, a breakdown of state functions or a function of uh, exclusion or marginalization, you can see why it tends to reproduce itself quite quickly over, over many contexts and, of course, of, over many countries um, and how it's responding to politi politics in the country. So one of the things I always say to people is that rather than understanding the climate, which has no discernible impact on the causes of conflict at all, what we need to understand is the local politics and especially the domestic politics of, of countries. Next, please. I also want to emphasize, of course, that in Africa, um, across its countries, what we're, we're not seeing particularly extreme levels of conflict as we saw before. It doesn't dominate the world as much as it used to, in part because when we take a little bit more of a of a different view of violence. When we look at, for example, um, where is there, where, which country is most dangerous to civilians? That's Mexico. Where has there been the most diffusion across the country? Of course, that's Palestine. In fact, Palestine has recently, as you can imagine, surpassed Mexico and most dangerous to civilians. Where are there the most active groups? That's Myanmar. And where are there the most fatalities? Again, Palestine is now surpassing all the others, but a few months ago, that would have been Ukraine. And when we look at the most extreme violence across the world, we find that there are two African states within that. Um, it was Sudan and Nigeria um, that occupied that particular position. But many other African states have high and relatively consistent rates of violence, as I mentioned before. But the situation across African states are in no way unique to African countries. And in fact, we're seeing quite a lot of, again, this investment in conflict occurring across many spaces. Um, and in some ways, this has given less credence to this notion that political engineering is going to fix the situation within African states, because of course, political engineering is not fixing the contexts in other countries. Next, please. One of the most important things to consider, though, is that, the, as I mentioned, the rise of non-state armed groups. So as civil wars have declined and, then, and insurgencies have declined across African states, but also elsewhere, there has been a strong proliferation of non-state armed groups. So these are the gangs and militias that I previously mentioned. 
The reason why this is so concerning is that while these groups don't produce as many violent events per group as, as an insurgent may who lasts through, throughout, um, throughout several years, but the number of these groups that are, that are operating simultaneously tends to have an enormous effect on the security of people. And in and of itself, that is creating more violence that has more possibilities of being both volatile and very difficult to end than an insurgent group that tends to be located in a space, have a political agenda, um, and, and while, of course, those insurgencies can lead to unbelievably high rates of violence, the combined influence of these many, many militias and gangs that are now operating across African states, it can be, is, are just as lethal, if not more so. Next, please. One of the things that we've been doing recently at ACLED is to try to figure out how we can understand how many people are affected by, so what is the, what is the exposure of civilians to different types of groups, armed groups or, or violent groups within their immediate area. And we created something called the conflict exposure metric. And while the, the summary points for Africa are a little different than the summary points for the globe, I still think that they bear mentioning here. So what we effectively have is, I believe this is just over last year, we have almost 11% of Africa's population as a whole has experienced through very, very proximate exposure, violence by state forces. And what I mean by that is that they live very close to an event, at least one event, in which state forces have been organized and violent in their vicinity. However, a very, very close second at 10.21% of the population have been exposed to the violence from militias. Now you can see that the total events are a little bit different, indicating that of course state forces are a little bit more clustered in where they're operational because you would assume that they're operating more within urban and peri-urban spaces. Militias are more diffuse in the sense that there are fewer events but they are affecting very, very similar numbers of people um, but in across many new spaces. Rioters are affecting about over 8% of the population and again, this is going to be clustered within uh, urban spaces, which is the reason that the total events are relatively low compared to the population. And we're seeing, of course, quite a lot of what can be mob violence and rioting happening, um, and especially within Southern African states. Rebel groups are affecting only 4% of the population. Now, of course, leading to a very high number of events, largely due to um, groups like Al-Shabaab, which are incredibly active, and of course what's happening within um, the Sahel. But the actual population exposed to the violence of insurgents and rebels is, is really quite low. And of course, keep in mind that, the, that it's over half, or sorry, under half, that, that is exposed to militias. So if you were to ask somebody in an African state, who are they more worried about experiencing violence from, it would certainly be the one that is much more commonly um, operational, which is the militias rather than the insurgent groups. And yet we spend quite a lot of our time and quite a lot of our thinking and explanations around conflict focused on a type of conflict that has precipitously declined within African states over the last 20 years. And then of course, foreign or other types of organizations um, are affecting about 1.3% um, of the whole population um, at a rate of 1,170 events over one year. And so what you can see here is, of course, is that rebel groups are highly clustered in particular countries, but militias and rioters, and, and to some degree state forces, although they can certainly be fighting any one of these groups, um, militias and rioters are really on the rise, they are proliferating, and they are much more of an immediate security threat to African populations. Next, please. What we've been trying to do, of course, is not just to understand what, how much violence we're likely to see, but also where we're likely to see it. Um, however, I mean, I'm somewhat, somewhat, let's say, um, hesitant to recommend 
predictive models that go beyond the next six months, in part because there's, as I mentioned, especially within African states, there's a continuity to it, but the, the violence does tend to move around a country. So I'm showing some, um, some estimates here from our CAST, um, the C Conflict Alert System for Sudan, and of course it's displaying where we expected um, to see a relative increase within the next few months across, this is actually for February, so you can see that there was a decrease in Darfur from, from, um, from February, but it was very, very short term, and in fact, um, we saw quite a bit more in Al Jazeera State, but this manages to give you some sense of where we expect to see much a, a strong increase, a limited change, or a relative decrease from the average, not a peaceful context, but a relative decrease from the average. So in this way, rather than show a number of statistics, I'm trying to emphasize that you can use the data to give you patterns not only now to, d to understand the variation in conflict patterns, but also into the future. But be very wary of going too far into the future, because as we all know, despite the relative continuity in the number of events, the actual groups doing these events or the places in which um, people are expecting to be um, assaulted by violence tends to vary quite a bit and move quite a bit within African countries. And this system can give you a, a very detailed understanding of, of why we expect to see um, and what proportion of increase we expect to see for conflict rates. And so next, please. So I will stop there.